Matt's family are still traveling back uh, from the holidays, so I'm grateful to be able to fill in for him this morning as they're enjoying some time away. And uh, Maybe that's the case for some of you this morning, that you're still traveling back after being with family. Maybe some of you are just uh, staying at home and staying nice and warm with all this cold weather. Uh, so if you're joining us online, welcome. If you're here in person, you brave the cold. We're so glad you're here and just grateful to be able to, to join and worship with you all this morning. So the 2021 Christmas season, it's, it's in the books, right? But our celebration of the Incarnation is never over, and our lovely decorations have stuck around for at least one more week here, at, at church at least, right? Uh, maybe some of you guys at home already have them all boxed up and put back away, or maybe you're keeping them out. That's all right. But there's uh, so many parts of the amazing story of the coming of Jesus that we emphasize heavily as we go through the Advent season. Some things like Emmanuel, the fact that Jesus was God with us, the incarnation of God in the flesh to dwell with us and humanity. The humility of how Jesus came, that he came without fanfare and in kind of a quiet way as a baby born in a manger. The unexpected nature of how he came, that he was born to these earthly parents in a stable, not set to inherit an earthly throne or any big plans to leave a political upheaval. He came in this humble way, that he was love come down, that the love of God was given to us as this baby born to save the world from sin. All these amazing and, and many more uh, aspects of uh, and, and really important and incredible things for us to reflect on each year during Advent as we consider the magnitude of Christ's coming. But one aspect of God sending his son to earth that can sometimes be overlooked by comparison during Advent um, is his grace and how Jesus was God's grace personified. Not only was Jesus the miraculous fulfillment of a vast number of messianic prophecies and the ultimate example for us as humans living among us as both fully God and fully man, he also came to earth as the perfect sacrifice for humanity, for us, to be redeemed through God's grace. So coming off of the holiday season and as we're kicking off 2022 here, our first Sunday together, I think that this is a theme of the incarnation worth pondering more as we gather here together this morning. And here's maybe just a few added reasons why considering grace may be much needed for many of us here on January 2nd. Maybe you're having a hard time forgiving the family member who didn't exactly do their part in cleaning the house for your guests. Uh, It could be that the gift for that special person in your life that you spent hours looking for and hunting down the perfect gift for is just going to be returned. Some of you maybe have some extra guilt after enjoying some of the holiday meals or goodies. It's possible that after extended time with family over the holidays, there might be some reconciling that may need to happen between you and a family member that has wronged you or that you've wronged. Or as you ponder maybe what goals you have for the new year, instead of feeling excited about these opportunities for growth, maybe you instead feel far more weighed down by your failures and flaws. So before we dive into our scripture this morning, I just want to say that I know that this is a church that gets grace. I know this because I've seen it and I've experienced it through you. This isn't a concept or practice of the Christian life that's lost on many of you in the room. You're not unfamiliar with God's grace and what that's all about. I also know that there are some here that are still learning about or trying to grasp more fully what exactly grace is and how our loving God offers it to us. So what my hope is with this message is that we can all collectively deepen our understanding of God's grace and respond with an abundance of joy and gratitude for his kindness to us. So Pastor Zach wrapped up our Advent series last week, A New and Glorious Morn, by reflecting on Matthew 4. And after he did that, it only makes sense to follow up that focus on repentance that he talked about last week by focusing today on grace, God's grace to us. So our scripture this morning is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, if you want to follow along with me on the screens or within your Bible. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, 
being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in this passage here in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, at this point likely from prison, and he's writing to the church to encourage these largely non-Jewish Gentile believers that they are united in Christ as a part of his body. They're no longer separate. They are with God's people through Christ. And so there's really a strong theme of unity in the church throughout the book. And in this section we read from here today, Paul really hones in specifically on their identity in Christ and the work of his grace to take them from where they were to where they are now. So the first point that we're gonna reflect on here today with this passage is that we we need to remember why grace matters. The way that Paul begins his writing at this point in this letter to Ephesus can come across as kind of a downer. Um, So I'm going to read again verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So you, you see that and you read phrases like you were dead in the trespasses and sins, followed the ways of this world, were by nature children of wrath, and other parts of it that stand out as like just really packing a punch. They're kind of like a, a kick, in, you know, kick in the gut. And so what he's drawing their attention to is the BC of their lives. That is who they were before Christ. Without Christ, this is the place that they were in and each of us is in we're in, and there's no way out of it except for Christ. The start of every person's story to find God's grace is at a place of coming to terms with our own sin and brokenness, realizing that we have a need for a Savior. We can't get out of this on our own. We need something, someone greater than us. I wonder, have you ever tried a familiar food with maybe a new twist? that completely changes it so that the old way that you had it before no longer quite compares and measures up. Uh, It could be maybe an idea shared with you by a friend that you tried and you liked, or it could be maybe a new restaurant's take on it. You probably have something that comes to mind for you. So my example is this, Monocle's Pizza with sweet and tart dressing. So those of you down here in Missouri, unless you've traveled back to Illinois, you probably don't know of Monocle's Pizza. Maybe some in the room do. Anybody, does anybody know Monocle's Pizza in here? No, nobody? A, f- a couple, okay. So this is thin crust pizza, and they have this dressing there, this sweet and tart dressing. A lot of people put it on salad, but I once had a friend tell me, hey, you gotta just try this with your pizza. Put it on top, dip it in it. It's great, it'll change the way you eat Monocle's Pizza. Sounded disgusting. I mean, look at it, bright red sauce, right? Some of you are like, what in the world is he talking about? I'm like, yeah, it looks gross. Once you tried it, man, once I tried it, Changed the way that I had Monocle's pizza. Every time I go there now, I've got to have the sweet and tart dressing. Um, So I wish I could have it with all kinds of pizza, but it's a special sauce at Monocle's, right? But the the point is, it's changed the way that I had pizza, especially Monocle's pizza. There's no going back to the old way. Once I had this dressing, it's so much better. Can't go back to pizza without the sweet and tart dressing at Monocle's. So maybe you've got some kind of example that comes to mind for you, right? But this is similar in a way to the point Paul is trying to make here in verses one to three. To believers, we know what life was like before Jesus. It wasn't good. We were stuck in our ways and lost in our sin, and it certainly doesn't compare to the fullness of life found in Christ. We should be thankful once we've found Jesus that we're no longer in those ways. We found a new and better way of life following him. So there's another scripture that's worth considering this morning together, and it's from Titus chapter three, verses three to seven. 
For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The grace that those who know Jesus as Lord have received should not be taken for granted or forgotten. We should be ever in awe of his grace and always remembering what he has done in our lives and the BC life that he's rescued us from. So we should consider responding in a, in a couple practical ways uh, related to this point in our, in our daily lives. Here's our first point of application. Um, to pause and be joyful for his grace. A regular part of our devotional time, our time spent with God, should be reflecting on his grace to us and responding with joy and praise. Not just to think on it and be like, oh, okay, that's great, God. But to respond, man, I, God, I'm so humbled and amazed by your goodness to me. And let that bring out an abundance of joy. Thinking on the kindness of, of our God and sparing us from that which we deserve, and not only that, but blessing us with righteousness we could never deserve can only be met with an abundance of joy. Much like that picture of kids getting that perfectly unexpected present at Christmas, our lives should exude joy in response to God's amazing gift of grace that gift of Jesus to save us from our sin. And secondly, we should thank God that we're no longer BC. Thank him that you're no longer in that life before him. We tend to be people who live in the present, right? So much of our lives is what's in front of us, what we can see here and now, what's going on currently. But reflecting back can be really healthy, and especially so in our spiritual lives. Not to dwell on the past, in an unhealthy way that can bring back harsh memories or guilt and shame, but rather in the freedom of forgiveness to reflect back on where we were and thank God that by his grace we aren't there anymore. Making space to do that, to look at the BC of our lives with the heart of gratitude gives us the perspective to remember the goodness of his grace and why we came to him in our brokenness in the first place to go back to that start and remember our need for our Savior to cling to him all the more tightly. So our second point is that God's grace leads us to change. Looking back at verses four to five of Ephesians two, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So this is where we see the Apostle Paul kind of shift gears, and he really is starting to make clear the stark difference between a life before Christ and a life after knowing Christ. But God, I love that, that phrase there. This is our story. We were one way, but God, in his love, called us to a better way. And I think that one of the aspects of God's grace that can be most confounding is that his kindness to us is intended to draw us nearer to him and surrender ourselves to his ways, not to be uh, free to do as we please with this free pass of forgiveness. That's not the point at all. The depths of his love led him to send his son to die for us, and his grace is not meant to be taken lightly, but it's to be a significant marker in our lives when we discover the truth of it. Much like the calendar literally changing at the coming of Jesus, our lives in response to his grace ought to be reevaluated and reoriented around him. When we truly grasp God and his grace, it moves us from death to life, from slavery to sin to freedom, from condemnation to righteousness, not because of anything we could have ever done or earned, but because of the goodness of God to us. Many of you are familiar with, with the show The Chosen, um, and there's a scene in that where Mary Magdalene is kind of describing her life change to Nicodemus, and he's asking her, well, who's this person that, that changed you so much, and what happened? And the best way that she can sum it up, I think, applies to our message this morning, and so here's the quote that she says. She says, but here is what I can tell you. 
I was one way, and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. And isn't that our story? So what can we make of this? What, how are we to respond here and now today? The first thing is this, that grace should move us to a response. If you are listening here today and you have not yet made a personal decision, a personal response to the grace of God to follow Jesus, I ask that you would prayerfully consider it. It's really a challenging and, and it's a difficult thing to see and accept our own sinfulness, our own brokenness, our need for a savior. But once we can do that, waiting on the other side of that is a new life and freedom that can only come by grace through placing your faith in Jesus as your savior. But for those of you in the room who already call themselves followers of Jesus, our prayer ought to be, how can I surrender more of my life to God in light of his grace to me? Romans 2.4 says this, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you into repentance? So these moments of repentance that God's kindness leads us into, these moments of repentance for believers are acts of sanctification, God wanting to conform us more into the image of his son, Jesus. And so in view of God's mercy, we should come to him saying, I know I'm still an imperfect sinner. God, there's so many ways I still fall short. Where might I be falling short in my life that I need to repent of, to claim God's grace for, and to look to him to overcome? It could be that through the power of God's grace in meeting with your repentance, that 2022 might be the year that you finally find freedom from the, the sin that's been weighing on you and that you've been entangled with for so long. I pray that that's the case for you, that God works in your life in that way. The second point of application is this. Grace means that we can let go of guilt and shame. It doesn't have to weigh on us any longer. This can be hard for us to grasp and and really receive, particularly for those in the room um, who see their flaws and imperfections all too clearly. You beat yourself up constantly over the ways that you fall short. Whether it's could be even something from this week or it could be something from years ago. Sometimes those things can just hang on us and we can't let go of them. We can't forgive ourselves for them. And we have ways of just hanging on to our shortcomings and our past mistakes needlessly. And so I want to make clear, though, this isn't to be confused with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is meant to lead us into repentance. Instead, what God's grace relieves us of is the burden of carrying the shame from our sins past, present, and future. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's Romans 8.1. I pray that you would receive that if you're struggling with that this morning. And so I hope that you'll hear this message of grace today and be reminded and encouraged that you don't have to bear those burdens anymore whether it's accepting the grace of God into your life for the first time and feeling that weight of sin lifted, that shame gone, or simply realizing again the reality of God's grace to you in a certain area of your life, I pray that you would give that over to him. Let him take that burden of guilt and shame off of you because of his grace. It's paid for it. You don't need to carry it. Know that God is taking care of whatever it is that's weighing on you. Jesus was, has borne that burden on the cross so that you don't have to live burdened by it. And the third thing that we're gonna reflect on this morning from Ephesians 2 is that grace is a gift to be displayed. Let's look again at verses six through 10. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The work of God's grace is something extended to each of us personally, but it isn't something that we should just keep personal. Just as our life changes inwardly when we discover and receive the grace of God, we should also look different outwardly because of his grace. As it states there in verses 6 to 10, 
we're not only forgiven, but in our new life with Jesus, God places us with him in the heavenly places as a testament to the immeasurable riches of his grace. God not only draws us to himself to redeem us, but he has in mind good works perfectly suited for us as his workmanship, his intentionally created human beings. It's amazing. He's got so much in store for us, so much to bless us with. And in reflecting on God's grace, it ought to move us in such a way that we respond outwardly. An overflow of love and grace out of abundance, out of abundance with which we have received. And there's a passage, passage later on in Ephesians where Paul reinforces this outward change in response to grace. And it says this, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. His grace is so great, so amazing, that it should well up within us a desire not only for others to experience that as well, but for us to be extensions of his grace to others. So here's a couple of ways that I believe God desires to display his grace through us, here and now. First is this, that we can display his grace by recalling his goodness to us. And so this is both a personal reflection of what Jesus has done for us, how his grace changed our lives, but it's also finding ways to express this. Asking God, going to him saying, God, how can I share with others the story of how you, you redeemed me, the grace that you've shown me? How can I tell about that? And when we have those opportunities, when he brings those to us to tell others how he's shown us grace, then we get to display to people the heart of the gospel through our own stories of redemption. We, we mustn't underestimate the power of our own testimonies to be used by God as a display of the immeasurable riches of his grace to somebody else. We never know what people are going through when we encounter them. And anyone that we encounter may be struggling, whether it's dealing with sin or brokenness over their mistakes. And our own story of God's grace can be used by the Holy Spirit in those moments to draw others to Jesus and to receive that grace for themselves. The second thing is this, that we can display his grace by being quick to forgive. Perhaps this is one of the most difficult things for us in our human nature, to extend the same kind of grace to others that God has extended to us. You'd think it would be easier to do, but it, it can be so challenging. But this is exactly what Paul encouraged those in Ephesus to do and what we should desire to live out as well. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. In our human nature, extending grace to someone else can be easier said than done. You, you've been there, right? We can struggle with feeling like we deserve to be angry with someone for what they did. We can hold on to that so tightly. We can want them to pay for what they did or wish ill on them because of the hurt that they've caused us. We want them to experience what we've experienced. Or even to struggle with bitterness and resentment that we just can't let go of. And I want to say that these things are from our human nature. They are not of God. It's in those moments that we must recall God's grace to us. He has forgiven us much, greater than we could fathom, sparing us from that which we rightfully deserved. And so if his love for us is so great that he would show even sinners like us grace, then we as his followers, his representatives on earth, are called to tangibly show his grace to others as well. Even if that means forgiveness when it's most hard. Following God's leading to do just that, to extend forgiveness, can be difficult. It can be messy. I know. But it can also be a powerful means through which God reveals his grace to others through you. As I was preparing for this message, there was a story that caught my eye online. Um, it could be that some of you guys have, have seen this going around social media already, but I felt that it, it really strongly demonstrated um, the grace of God, not only at work in someone's life, but how it ought to manifest itself through us, the way that God can work to display his grace through believers. So I encourage you to, to, to go and, and after service later today, look up the video and watch it for yourself. It, it's worth going to see. Um, we were unable to show it uh, here in service, but I'll do my best to, to relay the story here. So the background is that um, a 46-year-old husband and father of three named Officer Richard Houston, 
who worked for the Mesquite, Texas Police Department, was shot while on a domestic disturbance call that turned violent on December 3rd, 2021. Uh, the, the killer shot Houston in the chest before then shooting himself. And while the shooter went on to survive the injuries he inflicted on himself, Houston passed away. So Officer Houston's oldest child, um, his daughter Shelby, shared this in her, her eulogy at her father's memorial service. Here's a, here's a quote from Shelby's eulogy. I remember having conversations with my dad about him losing friends and officers in the line of duty. I've heard all the stories you can think of, but I've always had such a hard time with how the suspect is dealt with. Not that I don't think that there should be justice served, but my heart always ached for those who don't know Jesus, their actions being a reflection of that. I, al I was always told that I would feel differently if it happened to me, but as it's happened to my own father, I think I still feel the same. There's been anger, sadness, grief, and confusion, and part of me wishes that I could despise the man who did this to my father, but I can't get any part of my heart to hate him. All that I can find in myself is myself hoping and praying for this man to truly know Jesus. I thought this might change if the man continued to live, but when I heard the news that he was in stable condition, part of me was relieved. My prayer is that someday down the road, I get to spend some time with the man who shot my father. Not to scream at him, not to yell at him, not to scold him, simply to tell him about Jesus. So as I heard this story, I was just so struck by the depths of her compassion for this man. If anyone had the right to be anger, angry or bitter at someone, it would be, be her and her family. Yet in her own words, she couldn't come to hate him. She couldn't despise the man who murdered her father. Instead, she had a strong desire to tell him about Jesus regardless of how the world or how her human nature might tell her she should feel about the situation. So this seems by all indications to be the story of a young woman who knows strongly and grasps comprehensively the love and grace of God. This is a beautiful image of God's grace being displayed through her even in the midst of her grief in the wake of this unthinkable tragedy. Just as she had every right to be full of anger and hate towards this man, God had every right to condemn us for our sins to pour out his wrath on humanity and its sin. Instead, this young woman was moved to compassion for this man, and she longed to speak with him, to, to help him find a new life in Jesus. Just as Jesus, in, in exchange for our sins, offered himself in our place while we were still sinners in order to give us freedom from sin and life abundant and eternal with him. That is the amazing love of God. It's made abundantly clear through his grace that not only forgives what we did nothing to deserve pardon for, but it also offers blessings far more than we could ever deserve, all in response to our faith to him. This is the profound nature of God's grace. And I pray that your heart has been stirred this morning by his amazing love and grace extended to you individually. Let's pray.